So we're back and happy to welcome Dr. Sophia Ku from Harvard Medical School, who's going to be talking to us about uh, volatile organic compounds and diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you again. And um, thank you, everybody, for your grace and for your patience with my lack of Zoom savviness. Um, so thank you again for the invitation to talk to you about this topic today. Um, here are my conflicts of interest or research disclosures. Um, so again, today I'll be talking to you about breath volatile sesquiterpene secondary metabolites of fungi and how we use these for the identification and therapeutic monitoring of aspergillosis, also mucormycosis and other rare and emerging molds, and histoplasmosis. Um, so I think everyone here is very well familiar with the diagnostic challenges with aspergillosis, the problems with respiratory tract cultures, the problems with our glucan and beta uh, and galactomannan testing as well, um, aspergillus nucleic acid tests, next generation sequencing, and the problems of radiology as well. Um, in our hospital, the radiologist always tells us that it's likely to be a fungal infection when they see something like this, and often is not. And so how do we treat people appropriately when we're not sure what we're sort of treating? Um, so this is what motivated this work um, years ago. And so we started looking at um, the volatile space of pathogenic molds. Um, you know, this work was being done for other pathogens like tuberculosis, where people were looking at uh, the gas of tuberculosis and what it produces and what are the me metabolic fingerprints that you can actually find in the volatile space that you could then potentially detect in the breath. And so some of this initial work started with fungal cultures that we were looking and we we're not looking at the liquid part, but really at the gaseous phase above everything, uh, growing these on a var variety of different growth substrates that sort of mimic the human lung. Um, looking at these volatiles and concentrating them onto a sorbent bed, and then analyzing them using thermal desorption, GCMS, basically. Um, and so we're looking at the metabolic pathways of Aspergillus fumigatus and all of its carbohydrate metabolism and lipid metabolism, and um, also its secondary metabolism, and just looking at the gaseous sort of uh, manifestations of all this different metabolism to sort of see if there are different sort of unique metabolites that Aspergillus produces that we could sort of identify in patients as well to try to identify um, from the mixing of the gas from your mouth directly down to the alveoli. Um, so what became very apparent initially in doing these culture experiments is that Aspergillus fumigatus um, has very uh, unique sort of secondary metabolites. So it produces something called alpha transbergamotene and also something called beta transbergamotene, which are isomers of each other. And um, the way that they make these secondary metabolites um, in particular is through um, the mevalonic acid biosynthesis pathway. Um, so in the middle, you see this, um, it comes down to isopentyl pyrophosphate, this five carbon molecule that then it can put together into these 10 carbon molecules or these 15 carbon molecules or even 20 carbon molecules and make all these sort of synthetic byproducts after that um, using terpene cyclases. So they take this sort of long 10 carbon chain and they can make them into limonene, for example, camphene or pinene. Um, and for also they can use farnesyl pyrophosphate and turn it into these large 15 compound sesquiterpenes. So alpha brigamatine and beta transbergamotene for, for aspergillus fumigatus. Um, and for a while, it wasn't known how they were sort of doing this. It wasn't clear from the Aspergillus genome sort of where they were getting the enzyme to sort of cyclize these things. Um, and then uh, Yi Tang's group at UCLA found that in the fumagillin biosynthesis cluster, there's a hidden terpene cyclase inside that um, that can take these sort of long chain carbon molecules and turn them into these rounded uh, cyclic things as well. And alpha brigamotene and beta transbergamotene are sort of precursors to fumagillin which the aspergillus makes, of course, as an antibiotic almost to sort of control its environment and to, to fight against other pathogens. Um, and so these terpene cyclases are important and they're present in a lot of different fungi um, and most molds have them. Um, and so they turn these long carbon chains into different products that are precursors for other things typically, um, but many of them are volatile and you can actually see them in the headspace of these fun fungi if you try to culture them. Um, so what we also noted was that when we tried different Aspergillus fumigatus and trying growing them uh, in vitro, they're quite homogeneous in their profile. So Aspergillus fumigatus, um, we take type strains or clinical isolates, we did hundreds of these, they all kind of look very similar. And you can really tell Aspergillus fumigatus from other molds as well. So if you compare Aspergillus fumigatus to Aspergillus teres, for example, um, very, very different in this um, sort of late eluding, barely semi-volatile kind of um, area where you have these very large compounds that are you know, very high molecular weights, like 204, that are still volatile enough that you can sort of see them. And so um, secondary metabolites can almost be used as a fingerprint to tell apart these different molds from each other, the volatile secondary metabolites. Um, so Aspergillus teres, for example, um, it uses this terpene cyclases to create a lot of different structures. So you can see this elixine and the santaline, elamine, aquaradian, 
and chamagreen, um, very, very different sort of suite of different biosynthetic products. Um, it doesn't have that many terpene cyclases, but it takes that sort of 10, 15 carbon chain and it can turn them to all sorts of products because it's what's called catalytically promiscuous in which it's not that good of an enzyme. So it takes the same thing and it can turn into many different things almost by accident, kind of all these different sort of products. Um, so at the same time, of course, we're looking at patient breath samples and breath is really um, mostly what we inhale. So mostly breath is nitrogen, um, some of it's oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and only a very, very tiny proportion. So 1% is what we call VOCs or volatile organic compounds. And these are things that are carbon-based kind of that are um, reflective of metabolism. And the rest of it's just diluted in this matrix of everything else. Um, there have been over a thousand distinct volatile organic compounds that have been described in breath. Um, and a typical person has about 190 to 200 VOCs in the breath at any given time. And it tends to change a little bit over the course of the day. Um, and also depending on what you've been eating, for example, there are different sorts of changes that over the course of the day that happen. The origin of these is mostly endogenous. So they're products of cellular metabolism that are carried through the blood and then exhaled through the lung. Um, and also from your microbiome, there's products and byproducts of your microbial metabolism. And when you have something like a pneumonia or an invasive mycosis that sort of takes over, you can sort of see this metabolism kind of on top of your regular metabolism. Um, there's also exogenous contributions, of course, like if you take certain medications, like inhaled medications, for example, um, certain foods, certain pollutants, like if you drink orange juice, you can sort of see that inside your breath as well. Um, so in this initial study, we enrolled 64 patients prospectively, um, people who we didn't know if they had invasive fungal disease or not, but they were all suspected to have it and they were starting their workup. Uh, most of them were patients with hematologic malignancy, also some bone marrow transplant recipients, and a minority were solid organ transplant recipients, mostly lung transplant patients. And in the end of their entire workup, including biopsies as well, many of them, 34 of them did have invasive aspergillosis by the ERTC MSG consensus criteria. And 30 of them had other invasive fungal infections or pulmonary processes. And this included mucoralis, fusarium, sketosporium, histoplasma infections. Uh, many of them ended up just having possible invasive fungal disease where they had a syndrome that was consistent with it but never had any positive mycological testing. So on the left are two of the patients we sampled who had aspergillosis. And on the right are two without aspergillosis in the end. And in all these, the radiologist said, this person definitely has aspergillosis. Um, so when we sort of aligned these patients using their metabolites, um, what we found is that in patients with aspergillosis who are clustered here at the top, um, the smaller um, monoterpenes and diterpenes, they weren't really predictive kind of of whether someone had aspergillosis. So limonene, for example, is something that's just universally present in everybody. Um, you can sort of see this in all patients with and without aspergillosis. But these larger secondary metabolites, the beta transbergamantine, the alpha transbergamantine, and also some oxidized sexoterpene products that we never saw in anywhere in vitro cultures, but became very apparent in human samples, um, were very predictive of patients who had aspergillosis with a sensitivity of 94%, a specificity of 93%, and a positive likelihood ratio of 13.4, and a negative likelihood ratio of 0 0.06. And um, since that time, we validated this work on sort of more sensitive analytical instrumentation. And we found that it's not just these four sesquiterpenes. There's actually many sesquiterpenes that comprise the signature of Aspergillus fumigatus. And um, this, for example, a couple of cases to sort of illustrate, we also tried to see what happens over time. Like, you know, we often don't know if our patients are sort of getting better on antifungal therapy. Can you sort of look at the in vivo metabolism of these fungi in people and sort of determine, you know, potentially when you can stop antifungal therapy in some of these patients? Um, so this is a patient who um, on day zero, after having leukemia and after having an invasive fungal infection with a, um, a CT like this. Um, so she came in and she had um, fevers and had a chest CT for work above that and was found to have this large um, right upper lobe mass. Um, her serum galactomannan and beta glucan were both negative, but she had a positive BAL galactomannan. Um, so on day zero, she had this complex bouquet of about six different sesquiterpene molecules in her breath. And with voriconazole, it gradually sort of dissipated over time. And after day 53, we couldn't see it any further inside this patient's breath as she clinically improved. And in parallel with her CT sort of improving as well. Um, this is a lung transplant patient who ended up having a nodule just routinely on a, on a routine chest x-ray. And so had a CT scan for follow-up it afterwards. And um, he had a couple of these metabolites inside his breath on the first day we sampled him when he had this nodule. And um, with treatment, actually, the bouquet became a little bit richer or on day five, and then it, it abruptly went away on day 41 with, with therapy. And he had a positive serum galactamine and a beta glucan and also positive BL galactamine as well. And this was after his therapy. Um, 
this is another sort of case that was interesting because it sort of was very dynamic over time. Um, this is a patient who had CLL, had received many different prior lines of chemotherapy, including a lot of CAMPATH. And um, he came in because uh, someone had checked a glucan and galactamanin and they were positive and no one really knew where they were coming from. And um, he had a normal chest CT at the time. It was, really wasn't clear sort of where this was originating. Um, he ended up having an echo for his routine pre-transplant evaluation. It was found to have a very large mitral valve vegetation on it that we presume is potentially a, a source of endocarditis and a reason for why he had this positive galactamanin. Um, so he had an extremely rich sort of sesquiterpene profile on day zero, um, about seven different metabolites inside his breath. And um, he was treated with voriconazole prior to his transplant. So it went down, it gradually, gradually dissipated. Um, and you know he was asymptomatic the whole time, didn't really notice that there was anything going on. Um, around day 35, he had his allogeneic stem cell transplant. And soon after his immunosuppression started, his conditioning chemotherapy and everything, um, it came back. It had gone away and it sort of came back. Um, so he continued to be treated with uh, voriconazole and also added mycofungin during his stem cell transplant course. And gradually the signal dissipated from his breath. Um, but it was exciting for us because it was sort of a sense that this is a dynamic kind of thing that changes with the host immunity as well, kind of that you can sort of see it come and go in response to how it's responding to the patient and how it's responding to the antifungal therapy. Um, and this was uh, when it recurred, kind of when the when the galactamine sort of became positive again, also this signal kind of came back in his breath. Um, so the other thing is um, how to make this something that can be used outside of my lab. Um, you know, this is very labor intensive work. We sort of pick through all the patient's breaths and all their metabolites, try to identify these different fungal metabolites. Um, but how can you make this something that can be used just universally and more broadly kind of for the diagnosis of patients who have these infections? Um, so we've been working with Draper, who's a, um, they're a military contractor, basically a bioengineering lab here in Cambridge. Um, and they've been trying to commercialize this, this, what's called the GC differential mobility spectrometry sensor. And so this was initially developed for chemical warfare detection and explosives kind of on the battlefield. Um, so basically what it does, is it takes a ga gas sample in, it ionizes it just like we do kind of in our lab-based GCMS systems. And um, it, it's, you can separate these ions through a column as well, like we do in our GCMS system to sort of get separation of these different metabolites. And then um, it really shoots them through this really strong uh, microfluidic electrical field where it can separate these different molecules based on their size and their charge. And so what you end up getting is on the right kind of where you almost have like a, a gel kind of of a gas sample where if you sort of know what you're looking for, you can find specific metabolites in the person's breath or in any sort of gas sample. And the nice thing about it is that it's highly sensitive. It's parts per billion or even parts per trillion in many cases if you use pre-concentration ahead of time. Um, it's very selective. So if you know what you're looking for, you can find exactly that thing in every, any sample. And especially for something biologic, like when you're trying to detect a fungal infection, where it's not just one thing, it's many different sort of uh, components of a profile, you can detect many different samples, uh, chemicals in a sample at the same time. And so you can find a fingerprint and distinguish it from other fingerprints as well, which I think is important for fungal diagnosis. Um, and so the way we're doing our studies now is we're getting breath samples. We're running one on our standard um, GCMS on the right, which is gold standard lab-based method. You can identify all the different metabolites inside the breath sample, um, but it's labor intensive and it's most definitely not point of care. You know, it takes hours to sort of go through each of these samples to try to identify what's inside. Um, in parallel though, we're also using this GCDMS instrument as well uh, for rapid and really point of care metabolite identification once the metabolic targets are known. And so um, it runs a sample in about maybe 15 to 20 minutes, you get a sort of picture of the entire breath sample. And for something unique, like a sesquiterpene, which comes out very late in the run is not like something that's normally found in patients' breath samples. Um, you can sort of see them pretty easily. They kind of stand out pretty easily from the background. So this, for example, is some of the data from this instrument. So in aspergillosis, this is a patient with aspergillosis um, after a stem cell transplant. And this was that baseline prior to starting any antifungal therapy. So this is sort of time on this axis, the retention time. And so all the normal stuff like acetone, um, alcohols, everything comes up pretty early in a normal breath sample. And usually this area is pretty sparse. There's not that much that comes out late in the run kind of. Um, but when you have something like aspergillosis, these sort of secondary metabolites that are barely, barely volatile, they come out at the very, very end of the run like this. And so you can see this patient had one, two, three, four, four different peaks kind of inside his breath at least, and some tinier ones kind of buried inside as well. And even two weeks into therapy, these sample, these um, peaks start going away in this patient. Um, this is a heart transplant patient who um, had a chest x-ray and was instantly found to have a nodule and was worked up for this and even got a needle biopsy of this lesion. It was about 0.9 cubic centimeters in size. Um, so it was a proven case of invasive aspergillosis. Oops. And um, this is at baseline. He had these two little peaks kind of at the very beginning, again, separated out from the normal peaks inside the breath. And even a week after antifungal therapy was already starting to go away. 
Um, so we've also looked at other molds as well, because it's nice to sort of know that somebody has aspergillosis, but it would be even better if we could tell aspergillosis from mucormycosis and really get a specific pathogen identification so we can target therapy for patients. And so for mucoralis in, in vitro, at least, there's a totally distinct secondary metabolism than there is for aspergillus, and it's different by species. So you can see this, this is different, the three most common species that cause human mucormycosis. So rhizopus arises, um, var arises, fardelamar, and also microspores as well. And as you can see, there is um, a difference kind of in each of these in their, in their metabolites, kind of in their sesquiterpene fingerprint. Um, they're different from each other. Um, and then this is for fusarium as well. I'm um, doing some in vitro experiments to fusarium and looking at their signatures as well. And most of them do not have shared metabolites. Um, they're quite different from each other. So fusarium solani, it's consistent within the species, but then in other species of fusarium, they're quite different from each other. And they're different enough that you can really tell them apart just based on the culture. Um, the same thing, um, not to be repetitive kind of, but for Sketosporum and Lamentospore as well. So Lamentospore prolificans has its own unique suite of these um, sesquiterpene metabolites when you, when you look at it in vitro. And this distinguishes it from Sketosporum apiosperm and Sketosporum, Sketosporum boidii as well, where they're all quite different from each other. They have a totally different fingerprint and you can tell them apart from each other based on these fingerprints. And so um, this is all well and good, but it's very challenging to find enough patients who have, um, you know, Sketosporum apiosperum infections where you can get enough data kind of on these patients to really sort of dis differentiate them from other sort of fungal infections. And so um, we've been trying to use different models kind of try to figure this out. So we're getting all patients who are coming in, also doing some murine experiments in parallel as well. Um, so everyone here is well familiar with the diagnostic challenges in mucormycosis, how difficult it is to diagnose, very few diagnostics, uh, mostly relies on biopsy culture, often still a postmortem diagnosis, even though we suspect it in patients, and really fulminant, where we're, if delaying the right kind of therapy really does increase the risk of dying. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been testing this in murine models to try to um, you know, do this in large volume kind of at, at scale kind of where you can infect many different mice with different fungal species, try to differentiate what is different in vivo between these different models. Um, so we've been using a neutropenic model initially developed by um, Demetrius Quintianis and Russell Lewis uh, of, of neutropenic uh, mice, who we then infect um, intranasally with these different sort of species to try to characterize their, their signatures in, in vivo and also how it changes with antifungal therapy. Um, and so in murine breath, you, know, you can look at these different species as well that I mentioned before, the rhizopus microsporus, the different rhizopus arises as well. And um, as I mentioned, in, in vitro, they have different signatures. And the same thing happens in vivo as well, where they're quite different. And um, from in vivo to in vitro, there's quite a shift. Um, so in vitro, they're sort of living kind of inside this sort of enclosed, nutrient-rich, relatively environment. In vivo, there's the whole environment of the, the mouse lung and the immune response to the mouse as well, even though they're neutropenic. And so a lot of the sesquiterpenes become oxidized, like the same thing that we found when we looked at the in vivo samples from patients who have aspergillosis. A lot of them become oxidized and changed, um, probably by the human immune response and also by just the oxidative environment inside the lung. Um, we had an outbreak a few years ago of my, rhizopus microsporus uh, in, in several of our patients. And this was in the context of um, hospital construction and renovation. And um, what we found was though that there were these five patients who were able to get their breath samples kind of in time and sort of look at their samples and the sesquiterpenes inside them. Um, all of them had rhizopus microsporus ultimately. And um, you know, it was nice. They lined up pretty nicely with the murine mouse model. Um, there was only one metabolite in the murine mouse model that we did not find in these patients, but other ones did align. And this extra metabolite here labeled A um, was actually not something that we found in any of the murine mouse models, but was present in the patients who had, um, who had, had, a, who had mucormycosis as well. Um, so to just show you some of these patients who had mucormycosis in this cluster. So this is a patient with AML um, who's been treated with azocytine and venetoclax for this and was neutropenic because of this. And he presented with dyspnea, hemoptysis, and acute kidney injury. Um, and he had a chest x-ray at first. He didn't have this image yet. He was thought to have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and was treated with steroids and antibiotics. Um, and with that, of course, he got worse. And um, he got his chest CT, which showed this large uh, reverse halo here. And he unfortunately died soon after giving us his breath sample. Um, this is another patient who was a lung transplant recipient and had been exposed to voriconazole for a very long time for this purpurocilium infection that he'd had before and presented with fever, cough, and progressive pneumonia and antibiotics, um, and also died unfortunately soon after giving us this breath sample and had rhizopus microsporus growth from his postmortem cultures. Um, another patient in this cluster was a lady who had AML and she had a seven plus three induction. Uh, was getting mycofungin for febrile neutropenia and then had liposomal amphotericin for progressive consolidation. 
And as you can see with a sort of kinetics over time, um, on day zero, you know, this, the profile of these three sesquiterpenes was, was clearly present and, you know, still present throughout the, the rest of their course kind of, but gradually dissipated over the next couple of weeks. And this patient actually did okay. And um, the infarct gradually involuted and she actually, he actually did okay and went, went home after this and survived this episode. Um, this is another patient at MDS and had a allogeneic stem cell transplant and ha had relapsed AML after this and was not neutropenic. Um, she came with fever, cough, and this consolidative opacity in her lung over here. Um, we collected her breath sample and she had this signature. It was very low in abundance at the time. Um, she was treated by the inpatient team with, with Levaquin and sent home. About a week later, she came in with uh, left eye erythema, proptosis, chemosis, and horizontal diplopia. And you can see in her imaging here, it was pretty prominent, kind of very inflammatory and, um, and, and pretty severe. Um, and with that, she had a marked increase in the sesquiterpene signature inside her breath. Um, she received liposomal amphotericin, and it gradually dissipated over time. Um, she ultimately had surgery to sort of debride this area, which helped her recover from this episode. Um, the last patient in this cluster was also another lady who had MDS and had a prior allogeneic stem cell transplant complicated by GI graft versus host disease, but then unfortunately developed relapsed leukemia after all this and was coming in with febrile neutropenia. And um, she had this signature in her breath. Uh, she was treated with, um, I believe she got ezobuconazole initially. Um, it was sort of treated sort of empirically. Nobody exactly knew what was going on here. Um, and around day five, she started having new um, neurologic symptoms and had a, had a CT head of this. And unfortunately her infection spread to her CNS. And um, you know, despite getting liposomal amphotericin and, and despite um, you know, being evaluated by different surgical services, there was not much that they could do. And her signature sort of got worse kind of over time as she was on the ventilator and she gradually succumbed from this infection. Uh, moving on quickly to histoplasmosis. So histoplasmosis, as everyone here knows, is, is, has a high burden in the United States, um, especially in immunocompromised patients where it can cause really severe and disseminated infections. And um, as Dr. Gonzalez nicely laid out in her talk, you know, there's a high burden of disease in Central and South America um, where it causes over 80,000 deaths per year. And um, as we all know, there are some gaps in the diagnostic performance, you know, despite the fact that the lateral flow assays and the um, and the, the, the Mira Vista assay are, are quite good kind of, but there's delays in, in uh, turnaround time and also delays in uh, issues kind of with isolated sort of pulmonary histoplasmosis as well and assay sensitivity. Um, so we've been working with um, Dr. Jo Johanna Samoya at Hospital Roosevelt in Guatemala for the past several years um, and also collecting patients who have histoplasmosis, which is not common, but it does happen at Dana-Farber as well in patients who are returning travelers or patients who've been exposed through different environmental exposures. Um, try to try to identify histoplasmosis and its sort of different uh, volatile metabolite signatures and how it distinguishes them from patients who have TB in Guatemala and also patients of other fungal infections here. And also, again, to look at the metabolic uh, tendencies kind of over time with, with therapy and how it sort of changes and how it can reflect uh, the treatment sort of course in these patients. Um, so we've enrolled 92 patients in this study. It was sort of set back because of COVID and because of a complete freeze on any research in Guatemala over this period. Um, but of these, eight of them did have histoplasmosis with positive antigen testing or biopsy or culture. And out of these, eight of the eight had a unique sesquiterpene breast signature, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, four of them were sort of in the intermediate category where they had positive histoplasma antibody testing. Um, and they, did have, they didn't have an antigen test that was positive or any cultures that were positive, um, but they did have a potentially consistent clinical syndrome. And of these patients, two out of four of them had the sesquiterpene breath signature. Um, 80 of patients did not have histoplasmosis. They had other fungal diseases, they had TB or other pneumonia in the end. And out of these, 95% did not have this esquiterpene breast signature. Um, so this is a signature here kind of on top. You can see these different metabolites for, um, for histoplasmosis labeled on the right. And um, they're quite distinct from the metabolites that we see in aspergillosis and also with um, rhizopus microsporus mucromycosis, like a totally different signature from this reflecting its totally different secondary metabolism. And um, here's some of our GCDMS data looking at changes with antifungal therapy. Um, so on, in the first panel, the blue panel kind of here, you can sort of see this sort of blob of these three metabolites all sort of coming out together um, at the beginning um, before the patient received any sort of therapy. And after three weeks of antifungal therapy on the right, you can see that the blob has really diminished in its size. Um, and you can sort of see when we sort of look at the quantitative peaks and everything like that, it really has diminished over time with, with antifungal therapy, um, reflecting the response kind of in the, in the, of the mold.
Um, so in this study, though, we accidentally enrolled a patient who had coccidiotomycosis and also paracoxy, and um, also found that these patients totally have a completely different sesquiterpene signature from patients who have histoplasmosis, um, also quite distinct from anything we've seen in aspergillosis or mucormycosis. Um, so we're starting a study now um, in collaboration with Dr. Freeba Donovan at the University of Arizona, Tucson, um, enrolling patients who present with, um, with a community-acquired pneumonia syndrome. Um, you know, she's found that about a third of these are actually patients who have primary acute coccidiotomycosis. So we're trying to see if we can identify these patients with this volatile signature. Um, so in conclusion, these pathogenic moles release a great variety of sesquiterpene metabolites, and they're all quite species-specific and distinct from each other. Um, it's really important to sort of understand these and study these in vivo because there's large metabolic shifts when you sort of study these molds in vitro versus when you study them in vivo with the overlay of the immune system in the oxidative environment. And these profiles are really spectroscopically distinct from each other, and they're really kind of fingerprints that can allow species level discrimination and differentiation. And this allows the potential for direct in vivo assessments of, of, for diagnostics and also for the, um, the fungus's response to antifungal therapy as well. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening and for your patience again. And I want to thank everyone in my lab and also uh, to remember Francisco Marti, who um, inspired the genesis section with a lot of this work from early conversations we had years ago. Thank you very much, Dr. Ku. This was fascinating. Uh, the chat is blowing up. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the questions we have here. Uh, the first one is from Dr. Marcio Nucci uh, from Brazil, who's asking if you have different um, signatures in different stages of the disease, like with nodules or cavities. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Um, so yes, definitely for aspergillomas. Um, they are quite different than patients who have invasive aspergillosis in the sense that there's many, many more metabolites in those cases. And I think it reflects all the different stages of growth and death kind of inside these, 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 um, you know, these really complex laminated kind of aspergillus systems. Um, so in that, we've sort of seen some more richness kind of in the metabolites, but they have many overlapping metabolites as well with patients who have just regular invasive aspergillosis, which is a simpler profile. Perfect. And then we have a lot of people who are very interested in uh, the ability to discern between infection and colonization. Yeah, so that's been a common question that we've been getting. So we've actually been doing a separate sort of sub-study looking, just collecting patients who are, um, who are colonized and not infected. And I don't know if it's a matter of degree, because I mean, I do think that the, um, the ones that are growing sort of at low inoculants of the lung probably do have some secondary metabolites they're producing as well. Um, but we rarely see these sesquiterpenes in patients who are just colonized and not actually infected. Very good. Um, Dr. Anna Alastre Izquierdo is asking, how early can you detect this in the course of the illness? Um, also an outstanding question. Um, and I think that not one that we sort of can answer very clearly in people. I think what we can sort of say sort of retroactively is that we can look at the volume of disease on CT scans and everything and sort of guess from there to try to infer when we can see it. Um, the smallest volume we've been able to detect so far kind of looking back is like 0.7 cubic centimeters. Um, so pretty small nodule kind of in patients who still have a positive signal in their breath. Um, in mice, like in the murine models, you can detect it pretty quickly kind of after the infection. Um, so not entirely sure how that corresponds to the human sort of setting, but I think somewhere in the range of a small nodule that you can actually see that you can detect it. Perfect. And then Dr. Chandra Sekar from um, uh, Wayne State is asking if you have any data on uh, COVID-associated aspergillosis. Yeah, so we've been continuing this throughout COVID and getting patients who have suspected aspergillosis during COVID as well. And what we found is that the secondary metabolites are quite similar to patients who have just regular garden variety aspergillosis and setting of immunosuppression. Um, it's actually surprisingly robust to the host. So like when we look at the signatures kind of in patients who have like, you know, solid organ transplants versus patients with BMTs, and they're totally immunologically different kind of people and the disease is actually quite different in these patients. Um, the consistency is there, like they're quite consistent, although it's probably richer in patients who are more immunocompromised. Very good, Dr. Badali. Asking if you have any data for fail hyphomycosis. Um, we've collected a couple of patients who had fail hyphomycosis. Um, they all have their own signatures as well, but we we haven't done any murine experiments yet with these fungi since they're relatively rare. Very well. And then uh, one final question: Is there any correlation between the quantity of these VOCs and disease outcome? Yeah, I think there is, um, especially in these patients who've sort of failed, where you know they're they're sort of receiving maximal antifungal therapy, they're being managed right, kind of, but their host failure or other reasons kind of for why they're not doing well. And as as you saw in some of the slides, like it really does increase kind of over time if they're not being sort of treated appropriately. 
Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Uh, lots to think about.